Number 126. While assessing a young male who is struck in the chest with a steel pipe, you note that his pulse is irregular. You should be most suspicious for underlying cardiac disease, choice A, B, a lacerated coronary artery, C, bruising of the heart muscle, or D, traumatic rupture of the aorta. So, tr struck in the chest with a steel pipe, what kind of injury is this? Blunt versus penetrating? Blunt, yeah, more so. Um, irregular pulse, so what is that going to point to as maybe what was injured? The heart, yeah. So all of these questions, all of these are mostly dealing with the heart, or at least the circulatory system. Um, let's look at them, though. Underlying cardiac disease. No, we don't know anything why he would have underlying cardiac disease. He's a young male, so it's not like he's had a lot of time for problems to develop. Um, and it's not super likely that that would be the thing we should be most suspicious for. Not when there's this clear mechanism of injury. That just doesn't make sense. B, a lacerated coronary artery, meaning one of the arteries on the heart muscle that supplies blood to the heart was cut. Yeah, blunt trauma doesn't really point to that particular thing, and it just doesn't quite make sense um, with what we've got going on. C, bruising of the heart muscle. Yes, blunt trauma injury for sure. Um, also, that kind of thing could definitely cause an irregular pulse in your patient. And then D, traumatic rupture of the aorta. Yeah, if somebody has a rupture of the aorta, you're going to be seeing a whole lot more than an irregular pulse in your patient. They're going to be rapidly bleeding out internally. So, again, not really a thing you'd necessarily see with a blunt trauma and also not fitting what you actually have in this question. C is definitely the best fit. Number 127. When multiple patients present with an acute onset of difficulty breathing, chest tightness, and hoarseness or strider, you should be most suspicious of exposure to A, a nerve agent, B, sarin or somin, C, a vesicant agent, or D, phosgene or chlorine. Does anybody remember the section of the book that talks about, I forget exactly where it is, I think when it's talking about like mass casualty, terrorist, it's all kind of mixed in there hazmat type operations. Does anybody remember what any of these things do or are? Nope. Okay, so nerve agent, what could we assume? Something to do with the nerves, yes. Not, it could, it really depends what the agent is. What part it attacks, what it does, it's a very general term. Sarin and Soman are both nerve agents. Um, you should look this stuff up in your book. You need to, I doubt you're going to have a ton of questions on it, but you should look through briefly when it's talking. And I, I, remember, I don't remember which chapter it is, but it's the chapter that covers everything from like anthrax to like this stuff. Anything that um, you should know as far as like biological weapons, um, terrorist attacks, hazmat, all of that stuff is in your book and you need to be somewhat familiar with it because again, it's all into that operations heading. Um, so a nerve agent, which attacks the nervous system, sarin or somin are both nerve agents, a vesicant agent. Anybody have any idea what a vesicant would do to you? No, not about guess. Um, you know, you had to throw something out there. A vesicant essentially causes sort of a chemical burn. It will, you'll see um, those big blisters form on somebody's skin. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of these, just like there are multiple nerve agents. But a vesicant is a class of um, substance that causes chemical burns, causes those big water blisters kind of thing to uh, form on your skin. Phosgene and chlorine. Anybody know what these are? Okay, chlorine is what you put in pools. Uh, yeah, no, like that's, that's true. Uh, it can also be in a gaseous form which is bad for you. Inhaling chlorine gas is um, bad. Inhaling phosgene is also bad. They're both gas or airborne type weapons. Um, and both of these have been around for actually for a long time. Some of these are more like more recent-ish. I mean, really a lot of these have been around longer than you think. But phosgene and chlorine specifically both have been in use with the military since like World War I, if not before. Um, of all of these options, phosgene and chlorine are the only ones that attack the airway respiratory system. Nerve agents, we talked about, attack nerves. Vesicant agents attack like the skin surface. 
uh, or surfaces, tissues in general, but we wouldn't necessarily think they would cause difficulty breathing. Um, the ones that would do that would be phosgene and chlorine. So the answer here is phosgene or chlorine. And again, I would suggest looking this stuff up in your book so you at least have sort of a knowledge in case something comes up. You need to have something that goes, oh yeah, I think I read about that. I think I have an idea what it is. Number 128. A construction worker has a large sliver of metal impaled in his right eye. The most appropriate treatment for this injury includes A. Stabilizing the object with a pressure dressing. B. Removing the object and irrigating with saline. C. Removing the object and covering both of his eyes. Or D. Stabilizing the object and covering both of his eyes. D. We've talked about all aspects of this. You're supposed to keep anything in that is impaled, and you're supposed to cover both eyes whenever there is an eye injury to one of the eyes. Number 129. A 50-year-old male with a history of diabetes sustained partial thickness burns to approximately 15% of his body surface area while attempting to light a barbecue pit. He is conscious and alert and in no respiratory distress. What factor makes this patient's burn a critical burn? Again, this is something I don't necessarily expect you all to know off the top of your heads, but for the sake of the test, it's something that you need to be familiar with. Not just the rule of nines, not how to estimate how much of a burn or how much of a patient is burned, but also you need to sort of understand the criteria for what makes something a minor, a moderate, or a critical or severe burn. Um, and it is in your book. And there are slightly different things for an adult versus somebody under age five, um, and there's also different rules for elderly people, slightly. So we're going to talk about what makes a burn a critical burn. I'm not going to give you all the information, but we are going to talk at least about critical burns. Since we know in this question this guy does have a critical burn, we just have to figure out what part of him or his history makes it a critical burn. First, any burn that is circumferential around any part of the body is a critical burn. Why would that be? circumferential as in encompassing an entire something, whether that is the chest, the airway, an arm, whatever. What do, what does burned tissue do? Okay. It, it hurts, it swells, is what I was going for. Burned, damaged, inflamed tissue swells. So if you have an arm that is burned all the way around, say partial thickness burns all the way around your arm, and all of that tissue is trying to swell, right? Except all of it's trying to swell. So n there's nothing that can give. What, what can give in your arm? If obviously the tissue isn't giving, like the muscles that are actually burned, the stuff inside, so like blood vessels, you could have swelling that cuts that stuff off or clamps it shut. What else? What, what else do you have all around your arm that can give? Think more externally. Skin. So a lot of the time when somebody has a circumferential burn around any part of their body, they actually um, cut open, like essentially just make long cuts on the burned part because it is better to cut it open and allow it to swell than allow it to swell and either it bursts open itself, which is going to be obviously a lot worse than just doing it surgically, or it'll put so much pressure on the internal stuff that it will cause real complications. Not just for an arm, but think about if you're burned around your chest and it's swelling and putting all that pressure inwards much better to contain it in an appropriate surgical manner by opening it up, right? Um, so anything that completely encloses a part of the body is considered a critical burn because that is such an issue with that idea of all the swelling. Another thing that makes um, something a critical burn, if your face, hands, feet, genitals, or respiratory tract are burned. So anything sensitive. Obviously face and respiratory tract, that makes sense hands and feet, or genitals. If any part of those are burnt, either partial or full thickness, that's second or third degree burns, that makes it a critical burn. So not getting a sunburn on your face, but getting boiling water splashed onto your face and you know where it blisters up like a second degree burn does, it's a critical burn because of that. Um, other than that, other than the circumferential burn or those specific places getting burned, you also need to pay attention if a patient has 10% of their body with a full thickness burn, that third degree burn, it is a critical burn. Or if a patient has 30% of their body with a partial thickness or secondary burn, that is a critical burn. So those are the cutoffs. Those, those are the numerical cutoffs. Uh, minor, minor and moderate also have numerical cutoffs that are in your book. You need to look those up. 
30% for a secondary burn, 10% for a um, full thickness or circumferential or on those locations. Also be aware that if a patient is over 55 and has a moderate burn, we classify it as a critical burn. So if they have something that would fall into the category of being moderate, which again, those qualifications are in your book, but they're over 55, it becomes critical due to their age because geriatric patients, their bodies don't handle things quite the same way. Or if a patient has any complications, whether um, actual physical things like other injuries that have to do, you know, you have a broken arm that's also burned, that's a complication. Um, you have soft tissue injuries and you're also burned, that's a complication. If you have pre-existing conditions, um, congestive heart failure, things like that, and you're also burned, that's a complication. And so having a complication on top of a burn makes it a critical burn. Does that make sense? Okay, all of that is in your book, plus a lot more information that you need to at least have sort of a familiarity with. You need to know what that stuff is. Getting back to this question, let's look at what of these options could make this patient's burn a critical burn. A, his age, B, his history of diabetes, C, the extent of his burns, or D, the mechanism of injury. So yes, the answer here is B. His complication, he has a complication, which is that he is already diabetic. Um, it, it, that's one of those conditions where you need to be aware that it could have an impact on the way his burns work and heal. Remember, what is it, what does it deal with diabetics and their circulation? Do they have good circulation? No. So burns um, obviously need to heal, and somebody who has poor circulation does not heal as quickly. Um, they're not going to have as good of immune responses and other things going on. So if they have diabetes and a burn, it makes it critical because that's causing problems with the way the burn is going to heal. His age is not a condition because we only talked about somebody being over 55, making it a critical burn. He is 50, so that doesn't fit into that category. The extent of his burns... 15% of his body surface area has a partial thickness burn. What is the cutoff for a partial thickness burn that I just told you guys? 30%. Yes. Uh, and he's only at 15%, so that doesn't count. And also, extent of his burns could also mean where he's burned. Do we know anything about where he is burned? No. So we can't assume that it's in a place that would make it a critical burn. We're just assuming. Um, we, we, can't, we can't make that assumption, so we can't assume this is correct. And the mechanism of injury being the barbecue pit trying to light it on fire. Do we, is there any reason that we would have to make that be the reason why it's a critical burn? Critical burns have to do with what your patient has, not how it happened. It doesn't have to do with the situation. It has to do with what you actually have on your patient. So his history of diabetes is a complication that affects his burn, and that's why it's the best answer here. Seriously, look it up in your book, you guys. It's important. Okay, 130. During transport of a 40-year-old female with acute abdominal pain, you note that she has stopped talking to you and has become extremely diaphoretic. You should A, assess the quality of her pulse, B, repeat the initial assessment, C, perform a rapid trauma exam, or D, begin assisting her ventilations. So... Assess the quality of her pulse. Why would this matter? Right, so you've got a patient with abdominal pain, so you should automatically be thinking, okay, possible shock. Um, you're not really sure what all is going on, but you should always consider that shock might be happening when you've got acute abdominal pain. Um, she stopped talking to you and has become very sweaty. Diaphoretic is sweaty. So... Stop talking to you. We're going to kind of assume maybe, maybe altered mental status or maybe something physically going on where she's no longer functioning well. Um, and become extremely sweaty. What might that make you question? Isn't somebody being sweaty a sign of shock? Yeah. So that, that's a consideration. And even so, even if you don't know exactly why she's becoming sweaty, it's a change, right? You reassess patients. When you notice changes, you need to reassess them and figure out kind of what you can do to help fix that or adjust that or manage it. So, assessing the quality of her pulse would not be a bad option, right? She might have shock. Pulse is probably a good thing to check. Repeat the initial assessment. What is the initial assessment? Yeah, but, okay, initial means first, but what, what part of the assessment? What does that include when we say initial assessment? ABC's level of consciousness, yes, essentially. ABC's level of consciousness are the things to worry about for that. Um, C, perform a rapid trauma exam. 
we're already kind of getting this idea of, okay, we need to maybe like look at her and figure out what's going on. Right. We don't, um, we're not going to assume that suddenly trauma happened. Like she was sitting there, she was talking to you. She stopped talking to you. So we're not going to assume, Oh gosh, I need to look for trauma. Um, not the first step because she didn't just magically get hurt when she was sitting in your ambulance. And D, begin assisting her ventilations. We don't know anything about her breathing right now. The thing that will teach us about her breathing or whatever else she might need is B, right? If you assess her level of consciousness and ABCs, essentially you're saying, okay, there's been a drastic change in my patient. Let me see what's happening with her. Let me go back and do my reassessment uh, of the initial assessment. You're not looking for more wounds. You're looking for that she still have good airway, breathing, and circulation. And that's what makes most sense here, since there's been a sudden change in your patient. So A is not bad, it's just incomplete. Quality of the pulse is one thing. The entire initial assessment is really what you should do, all of those options. 131. A teenage boy who is involved in a bicycle accident has a puncture wound in which the bicycle kickstand is impaled in his leg. The most appropriate method for treating this injury is to... A, remove the kickstand in a circular motion and apply a dry sterile dressing. B, cut the kickstand off just above the skin and stabilize it with a sterile dressing. Excuse me. C, leave the kickstand attached to the bike until the physician can remove it safely. Or D, unbolt the kickstand from the bike frame and stabilize it with bulky dressings. D is definitely the correct answer. A, remove, well for one thing we don't ever remove objects, impaled objects. For another thing, removing it in a circular motion, you're essentially saying, I'm going to twist this piece of metal until it comes out of your skin. Yeah, that sounds terrible. Uh, B, cutting the kickstand off. So you're removing it, like you're leaving the skin, but you're making it easy to transport, but that's not the easiest way. Cutting the kickstand off is a whole lot more effort than just taking it off of the bike, like as a whole. Uh, it's probably going to cause a whole lot more pain and trauma to that area of your patient, their injury, because you're not going to be able to cut it off easily. C, leave the kickstand attached to the bike. So basically what you're saying is that you're going to transport this kid with the bike held correctly in place so that the kickstand doesn't move on the, on the cot. Like somehow that's going to work. That's insane. Um, D makes by far the most sense. Leave the kickstand in the boy. Remove it from the bike in the easiest way possible so you can still transport him safely um, without causing yourself a whole bunch of unnecessary problems or causing your patient a whole bunch of unnecessary pain. 132. You begin transporting a 60-year-old male with severe chest pain. Your estimated time of arrival at the hospital is 70 minutes. The patient is receiving 100% oxygen via a non-rebreathing mask. You should A. Remove the mask and apply a nasal cannula. B. Drive with excessive speed to arrive sooner. C. Attach an oxygen humidifier if you have one. Or D. Remove the oxygen until arrival at the hospital. C is the best answer. So we'll talk through these. A, remove the mask and apply a nasal cannula. No, you're not going to go down to a lower level of care um, for your patient. Non-rebreather is sufficient, but you don't want to go down a step. B, drive with excessive speed to arrive sooner. No, remember, we are only ever legally, at least in Texas, allowed to go 10 miles above the posted speed limit, and that's only when necessary, like absolutely. Um, so you can go a little bit faster, maybe, if that seems appropriate, but certainly not excessive speed. Um, no matter how fast you drive, you've got to remember, you've got a patient in the back as well as a partner in the back, and driving fast is more likely to cause you and your patient and your partner to get really, really hurt and possibly kill someone else on the road. Um, it's not going to make all that much difference in terms of your time, but it makes a lot of difference in terms of your safety. C, why would you want to attach an oxygen humidifier? What's the, what's the goal of that? Say it louder. Yeah, it's going to take a long time to get to the hospital. So when you're breathing room air, you're breathing some amount of humidity, humidity or humid air, right? Um, depending where you are, it's more than others. If you live in Houston, you're breathing a lot of humidity. If you live in Dallas, you're breathing less. But you're still breathing air that is humidified naturally. It's called... Yeah, moisture in the air, uh, especially like after a rain that we just had, you're going to be having a whole lot more of it. That humidity is good. It helps keep the nasal passages um, moist, which is what they need to to, be, to run properly. Um, that, that's just how your body naturally operates. Oxygen in a tank is dry air. It's very dry. There's no moisture in there at all. 
And to be running on that for 70 minutes with no moisture or humidity at all in what you're breathing is really going to dry your patient out big time. Um, they're going to be losing a lot of fluid because they're not having that extra moisture added in. Attaching an oxygen humidifier in a case like this where, yeah, your time of arrival is 70 minutes away would be very, very helpful for your patient. Also, it's the best answer because all of these are really wrong. Like D, remove the oxygen, very bad idea. Again, just as bad as putting on a nasal cannula and neither one makes any sense for your patient. 133. You are dispatched to a skilled nursing care facility for an 80-year-old female with abnormal behavior. The patient is clearly confused and asks you if you are her husband. As your partner administers oxygen to the patient, you should A, determine the patient, patient's baseline mental status, B, inquire about a history of Alzheimer's disease, C, obtain a complete list of the patient's medications, or D, ask an attendant for the patient's medical records. Yes, I think that's what I heard most people say. A is the best answer. Determine the patient's baseline mental status. We had a question like this earlier on, I think in the last packet full of questions. You always want to know what a baseline is when you've got an altered mental status patient, uh, especially when they're elderly and you might assume they might already have some degree of altered mental status. You want to know what their baseline is. So ask a nurse or whoever's around. The others just aren't as good. Asking about a history of Alzheimer's disease doesn't really tell you much about how your patient should be behaving right now. And medications and medical records, they are nice to know, but again, not so much in terms of actually helping your patient. They're not as vital or they're not as uh, immediate for what's going on. 134. An elderly male fell and experienced a possible fracture to his left hip. His left leg is flexed and externally rotated. The most effective method for splinting his injury is to A. Straighten his leg and fully immobilize his spinal column with a backboard. B. Bind his lower extremities together with cravats and place him on the stretcher. C. Place a pillow under the injured extremity and secure him to a scoop stretcher. Or D. Carefully straighten his leg, apply a traction splint, and secure him to a backboard. So this is a classic presentation of a hip fracture. Flexed, externally rotated, it will usually also appear shorter just based on the way that fracture happens. And the, the really strong muscles that typically hold your hip in place are going to contract. They're going to contract a little bit and pull the bones in, and that's why it looks like it's a slightly shorter leg, also because it rotates out. Um, looking at the options, straightening his leg and fully immobilizing his spinal column with a backboard. Sorry? It's not actually dealing with the fact that he has a hip fracture, right? Um, you don't know that his spinal column needs all that immobilization. His leg does. And also just straightening it and then doing nothing else is going to be really ineffective. Um, unless you have a good way to hold it in place safely with the splint, it's not going to stay straight. B, bind his lower extremities together with cravats and place him on the stretcher. When I say cravat, do you know what I mean? They're the triangular bandages, essentially. Um, tying the legs together, the idea would be that since it's a hip fracture and not a really convenient splinting position, using the other leg as a splint kind of helps keep them both in line with each other, is the idea behind that one. C, place a pillow under the injured extremity and secure him to a scoop stretcher. The problem with this one would be placing a pillow under the extremity. You might want to pad around it, but putting it underneath isn't going to do anything, not with what we've been told about his current position. Flexed and externally rotated, and like I said, it will probably be slightly shorter. There's no indication that you want to somehow lift his leg up with a pillow underneath. You might want to put a pillow, like I said, on the outside of the hip or maybe between the legs to kind of keep it stable, but not underneath. And then D, carefully straighten his leg, apply a traction splint, and secure him to a backboard. What do we use traction splints for? Mid-shaft femur. Mid femur fractures, yes. A hip fracture is not going to be helped by a traction splint, and in fact you're going to be hurting him a lot because you're putting a lot of pressure on that fracture without actually fixing anything. When we say hip fracture, remember we're not talking about the pelvis. We're talking about the place where the femur kind of, where it hooks into the pelvis right below that ball in the ball and socket joint. So essentially it's a proximal femur fracture. We just call it a hip fracture because that's right where it is. So the best answer would be B, 
bind the extremities together and place them on a stretcher. It's going to allow for that leg to also help stabilize the hip. And then, like I said, if you were to pad around it between the legs, would also make him more comfortable. And that's your goal. 135. You are dispatched to a residence for a 40-year-old female who fainted. Upon your arrival, the patient is conscious and alert and states that she is fine. Her husband tells you that she fainted after receiving news that her sister was killed in a car crash. You offer oxygen to the patient, but she refuses to accept it. At this point, your primary concern should be to A. Determine if she was injured when she fainted. B. Provide emotional support regarding her sister. C. Advise her that she needs to go to the hospital. Or D. Obtain baseline vital signs and a medical history. Good. A is the best answer here. Yes. I don't know. I, I've seen it before, but I've also done this review before. So I don't know if you guys have seen it on a test or something, maybe. Uh, just keep in mind for this one that you've checked, you've tried to give her oxygen, but that's all you've done so far as far as patient assessment. Or that's the point that you've gotten to. So you haven't done any sort of trauma assessment to try to see if she has any injuries. And that would be the next step. She may need emotional support, but just because she says she doesn't want oxygen doesn't mean she doesn't need treatment or at least assessment for everything else. And that's why A is the best choice. 136. A 19-year-old female has just been extricated from her severely damaged car. She is on a long backboard and has been moved to a place of safety. As your partner maintains manual stabilization of her head, you perform a rapid assessment. The patient is unconscious, has slow and shallow respirations, and bilaterally closed femur deformities. You should A. Stabilize her legs with the anti-shock garment. B. Apply 100% oxygen via a non-rebreathing mask. C. Obtain baseline vital signs and transport at once. Or D. Direct your partner to begin ventilatory assistance. D. Yeah, even though this is describing a more severe traumatic scenario than some questions we've had, remember that basic setup still applies. You go with your patient assessment, and if it requires oxygen, if it requires ventilation, that's what you need to do. In this case, we know it's ventilation versus non-rebreather because of those slow, shallow respirations. 137. A 30-year-old male has a large laceration to his right lower abdominal quadrant with a loop of bowel protruding through the wound. When treating this patient, the EMTB should recall that the A. Protruding bowel must, should be kept warm and moist. B. Open abdomen rapidly draws heat into the wound. C. Wound should be covered with a dry sterile dressing. Or D. The bowel should be replaced in order to avoid infection. A. a. Yes. Remember, when it says the bowel should be replaced, they mean putting it back in position, and that's definitely not true. And we know that warm and moist is the correct way to deal with an abdominal uh, wound. 138, we're going to skip because it has to do with intubation. 139. A 52-year-old male presents with a fever of 102.5 and a severe headache. As you assess him, you note the presence of multiple blisters on his face and chest, which are all identical in shape and size. This patient's clinical presentation is most consistent with A. Smallpox B. Sarin toxicity uh, B. Sarin toxicity, excuse me C. Yellow fever virus or D. Cutaneous anthrax so we already had a question sort of like this. Um, if you got that one wrong, you might probably get this one wrong too. Do y'all want to take a guess what the answer would be? Smallpox. Smallpox is the correct answer here. So sarin we talked about as a nerve agent. Um, doesn't necessarily put these blisters on him that are identical in shape and size. That's pretty unique. Yellow fever virus. Does anybody know what, what yellow fever does or is? Uh, yellow fever, actually, it's a virus that attacks, among other things, it attacks the liver. And so it's called yellow fever because the person actually looks jaundiced when the liver starts being damaged enough. So yellow fever doesn't seem to apply, not with this sort of blistery rash. And cutaneous anthrax, it's a form of anthrax. You've got pulmonary, which is like inhaled. You've got cutaneous, which would be more of like a skin contact kind of thing. And you usually see um, black irregular lesions with that one large, and they're not uniform at all. They're um, very, very distinct looking. Um, and you don't see a ton of them next to each other usually. Lesions, like, like blisters or whatever. 
Um, so the best choice is definitely smallpox. That small, identical, even uniform kind of looking rash is a smallpox um, thing, which realistically you don't see anymore because we don't have that in the U.S., um, but you should still know what it looks like. I'm sure it's still in your book as an option. 140 we're also not going to do because it's an intubation question, and we don't do those. 141. Um, we'll do this question. It seems a bit silly to me. During an altercation in a bar, two patrons got into a fist fight. The first patient, a 44-year-old female, was struck in the mouth and refuses EMS care. The second patient, a 39-year-old female, has a small laceration to her left knuckle and also refuses EMS care. Which of the following statements regarding the scenario is most correct? A. You should contact the police and have them arrested. B. The 39-year-old female is at high risk for an infection. C. The patient struck in the mouth should be immobilized. Or D. The 44-year-old female is at high risk for an infection. So like I said, I don't really like this question, but we are going to talk about it because the way it's worded, it, it's, it's a fairly, whatever, clever, detailed wording, and you may see a question that sort of is like this, a little bit confusing on the test. So the best answer is B. Um, does anybody want to make a guess at why or try to explain why? Yeah, because among all the injuries that were offered here, she has a small laceration to her knuckle from hitting the other girl, the other woman in the mouth. So that laceration is open. She can get infected through it. Also, it came from the other person's mouth, probably on a tooth or something, which everyone should know you have a lot of germs in your mouth. Mouths are gross. Um, based on that, the best answer is that she's at high risk for an infection out of the available answers. Realistically, most people wouldn't think a little cut on the, on the neckle is a high risk, quote unquote, but it is in the sense of open wound in a very bacteria germ full place. Um, none of the others fit quite as well. There's no reason why the other female would be at high risk for an infection. The patient's struck in the mouth. There's no reason why she should need to be immobilized. We, we, mouth injury or mouth like a punch does not mean you need spinal mobilization. That's a huge jump in logic. And contacting the police and having them arrested isn't your job. Uh, for one thing, the police should already be there and should have already cleared the scene before you got into it because I'm not going to step into a scene where there's a fist fight without knowing that it's okay for me to get out there and they're not still trying to swing at each other. Um, also, getting them arrested for this doesn't make sense. The only time you really use law enforcement in that kind of way is when you have to have the patient taken into custody because you have to treat them and you can't properly restrain them yourself. Uh, it's not a thing you'd casually do because you think that they shouldn't be fighting at a bar. So the best answer is B. 142. A two-year-old female fell from a second-story window and landed on her head. She is unconscious, has slow and shallow respirations, and a heart rate of 90 beats per minute. In addition to spinal immobilization, you should A, assist ventilations, begin chest compressions and transport. B, insert a nasal airway, assist ventilations and transport rapidly. C. Apply a non-rebreathing mask and transport to a trauma center. Or D. Insert an oral airway, assist ventilations, and transport rapidly. D. Yes. We talked about it already. Somebody, If she's fallen on her head, what is the likelihood of her having a head fracture, spinal fracture, something like that, or skull fracture? Probably pretty high. A lot of trauma impact to the head, so we would not do an NPA. And um, she definitely doesn't need chest compressions. There's nothing to indicate that, not with that heartbeat. And a non rebreather isn't going to do it when she has slow and shallow respiration. So the only thing that is a good answer at all is D. There's nothing wrong with D like there is with all the other options. Number 143. A six-year-old female was riding her bicycle and struck a clothesline with her throat. She is breathing but with obvious difficulty. Your rapid trauma assessment reveals a crackling sensation in the soft tissues of her neck and facial cyanosis. In addition to the appropriate airway management, the intervention that will most likely improve her chance of survival is A. Requesting a paramedic ambulance B. Careful monitoring of her vital signs C. Rapidly transporting her to the hospital or D. Quickly immobilizing her spinal column C. We kind of had a question like this already. Uh, I did want to go over this because of exactly what it's talking about with your patient. 
So that crackling sensation in the soft tissues of the neck and facial cyanosis, what do we think is, what, what is that? There's something called subcutaneous emphysema. Have you all heard that phrase? It typically happens for something like this when the trachea is messed up, usually ruptured in some way, and air can escape into the surrounding tissues of the throat. I did want to talk about this because it's pretty distinct. Um, you're going to have that, that crackling sensation. That, that's, um, you're going to basically be feeling crepitus, like air bubbles. It's not bones grating against each other, but it is the um, feeling of air bubbles moving past each other in a place where they shouldn't be. Um, and it's that crepitus, that crackling kind of feeling in her neck because air has escaped into those layers. And that's really dangerous. Um, also pointed to with her facial cyanosis, obviously air is not passing through normally and getting her well perfused. Um, so definitely you would transport her to the hospital in this case. You need to get her there as quickly as possible because you can't fix that. Um, and none of the other things are going to fix what's happening to this patient. Um... Number 144. Okay, we'll do two more. Number 144. A 17-year-old football player collided with another player and has pain to his left clavicular area. He is holding his arm against his chest and refuses to move it. Your assessment reveals obvious deformity to the mid-shaft clavicle. After assessing distal circulation and neurological function, you should A. Perform a detailed physical examination. B. Straighten his arm and apply a board splint. C. Immobilize the injury with a sling and a swath. Or D, place a pillow under his arm and apply a sling. C is the best answer. Uh, sling and swath is the classic way to deal with this. It's a clavicle fracture, so you don't necessarily have to splint anything because you can't splint that. And you don't have to mess with this. What you want to do is make sure that you're taking all of the weight of this arm away from dragging on the clavicle. You want to take care of, like, reverse what gravity would be doing to hurt him more um, and just keep it held up and tight into the body. 145, last one. You are triaging four patients who were involved in a head-on motor vehicle crash. Which of the following patients should be assigned the highest triage category? A, a 50-year-old male with an open head injury and no pulse. B, a 49-year-old female with diabetes and difficulty breathing. C, a 36-year-old female with back pain and numb extremities. D, a 29-year-old male with bilaterally closed femur deformities. So remember, when we talk about triage, we've got the four categories. We've got, which one's the highest? Red. And remember, red is people who are alive, who are um, not requiring an extreme amount of assistance to keep them alive. So we're not talking like cardiac or respiratory arrest, but definitely somebody who needs a great amount of assistance. They need resources that you can provide to them. Uh, what's ne next down is yellow, and yellow is... No, that's green. Yellow is people who are injured, have substantial injuries, but are not in a life-threatening situation. So we're talking things like, um, you'll see a lot of breaks, like bones and, and some amount of bleeding, not arterial bleeds, but like just bleeding. Um, that definitely needs assistance, but it is def it's in the next category down. Um, green is walking wounded. Green is people who can move themselves from the triage area to the transport area. Because the way this works is you have a triage tent or, or section, and then you also have a place where people who are red, yellow, green, uh, and black are also put. So green people can walk from triage to the green treatment section. Red people have to be taken to theirs. Yellow have, people have to be taken to theirs. Uh, and black people have to be taken to theirs. So that's kind of the category for green, is if you can make it on your own endurance and stamina and feet or whatever, uh, you're in the green zone. And then black, bottom one, dead or um, pulseless, um, no breathing, something that is going to take an extraordinary amount of resources to help with. Somebody that is going to essentially require at least one trained medical professional just helping them for the foreseeable future. Um, it's just too much resources to give to one patient when you've got a lot of patients. So, based on those, what category does A fall into? Black, definitely. Open head injury and no pulse. You know, if you've got the resources and the people, help him. Otherwise, he is a bottom priority. Uh, B, a 49-year-old female with diabetes and difficulty breathing. 
So remember, red is people who um, can't move themselves to the treatment area and also have a major life-threatening problem. Yellow is people who can't move themselves to the treatment area, but um, typically their problem doesn't have to do with like one of the main level of consciousness or ABC type problems. It's, it's more of like soft tissue or, or physical injuries, musculoskeletal, kind of whatever. So she'd be red because of that difficulty breathing. Uh, remember, red, okay, think of it this way, red has ABC problems, but they are not actually in some sort of arrest. They're, they're still going, but they're having problems. C, a 36-year-old female with back pain and numb extremities. Yellow or green, we don't know enough about whether or not she can walk with that numb extremities. We don't know what's happening there. Uh, we might call her green. We might call her yellow. We don't know, but certainly not red, right? Um, and D, a 29-year-old male with bilaterally closed femur deformities. She would, uh, he would probably fall in the yellow category. So he's bleeding, certainly, and that is a concern, but it's not open, and it is a long bone fracture versus um, an ABC-type problem. So out of these options, the best choice for red would be B because of that difficulty breathing. And again, diabetes is one of those conditions that usually causes complications with whatever else is now happening. It's a chronic condition that causes problems, complications.